Isometrics are probably the most underutilized, undervalued, yet most effective training tool. Isometrics can make you build muscle and strength and thus help you burn body fat and get leaner, yet nobody ever uses them or does them properly. This is terrible. Today's episode, we're going to talk all about isometrics. Um, this, Unsexy, but effective. This was something that was a staple with strength athletes back in the day. Like isometrics was how all of them trained, you know, at least a third of the time. And uh, of course they had incredible feats of strength. Um, and then it kind of fell out of favor with the development of machines and cables and stuff like that, which is, it's too bad because there's a ton of studies, a ton of studies done on isometrics and and their value in, in strength training. Zero emphasis put on this as trainers in the last, like, I mean, coming back right now, but yeah, first 10 years of my career. I didn't learn about them at I all. I can't think of any, any kind of certification or uh, anything from the academic world when, you know, researching all the stuff for how to train clients. Like, it wasn't even part of the conversation. I can't believe how undervalued they were. It's, it's something that, I mean, I, d I didn't even get an opportunity to really incorporate it into my programming with clients because I was so unaware of how valuable uh, it was for for all types of clients, everything yeah. from a, a athletic client to a advanced uh, age client to beginner, uh, addressing uh, imbalances mm -hmm. to beginner. I, I mean, the, the list goes on and on on where isometrics play a, a huge role in the success of whatever your client. And I just wish I would have understood that. You can't overstate that. Isometrics can be used for everybody, for any goal fitness goal, aesthetic goal, they can be applied and they will accelerate your results. So long as they're applied properly, they will accelerate your results. That's that's what makes them so effective. There's, it's I can't the think safest of, method. I was just going to say, I can't think of another training technique that can be applied across the board, like isometrics. I, in fact, off, right now off the top of my head, I can't, I can't even think of one. But isometrics, you could take anybody, regardless of their goal or experience, use isometrics appropriately and they'll get better results. It's so par for the course for our industry to not highlight it because it's unsexy because you can't sell anything with it because anybody can do it. So we just, we just, ah, uh, let's, let's, we won't yeah. talk that much about it because it's, uh, it's too, it's too basic. It's too easy. Every, you don't need anything. Like it's so crazy how, how we do that in this space. Like some of the, some of the best stuff, is the most basic, basic thing. Like I, I was thinking about this the other day. This has nothing to do with this topic, but it's just thinking about this now. Is like, well, you know, we get so many questions around the newest supplement that hit the market, and you know, comparing this versus that in these in the performance supplement world. And it's like nobody talks about taking vitamin D every day. You know, nobody talks about that. Like the and the and it's the been bit. around too long. Yeah, and it's and it's cheap. And it's basic yeah. and it's like, but the, the value of that is, and same thing, even like, even creatine is like not even talked about anymore because it's so cheap and easy to get a, a, get a hold of it. And if you do hear about it, it's all these different formulations. So I feel like that's like one of these things here where the space saw it, there was no way to really monetize it much. And so it's like, oh yeah, those are beneficial, yeah. but oh, uh, let's look at these things that you are all you need to do is add like vitamin D's, yeah. you know, add like Z's or X's to, <laughs> to branding and then, you know, it's cool. I thought you were going to make another joke with that. <laughs> yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds no, me of PG. Do you guys remember when it was acai berries? Were the big yes. Deal? Super high in, you know, blueberries are like, <laughs> like same. I, I yeah. mean, the profile on a blueberry and a acai berry is like, it's just one was from the Amazon and we never had them here. So I'm going to spend $15 on some of these. Yeah. Versus blueberries, I could buy the grocery store for $2. Blueberries, just as good. No, it's super true. I, so isometrics, the Soviets did a lot of studies on isometrics. And the Soviets, during the you know the time of the Cold War, I mean, they dominated the strength sport world. Um, and then more notably, famous people like uh, Bruce Lee. Bruce mm -hmm. Lee was huge on isometrics. He used to talk about them all the time. And Bruce Lee, although he was, you know, he, he wasn't really a professional fighter. Obviously, he was an actor. He did do demonstrations where he would demonstrate his strength and his power for a guy his size. Even today is quite impressive. In fact, there were, and this was, I don't think this was ever filmed, but there were, you know, lots of eyewitnesses where he could hold a 120 pound dumbbell at arm's length. That's wild. With isometric strength. Now this is a hundred and I don't know how much he weighed, 150 pounds or something like that. He wasn't a big dude, but he talked about isometrics, giving him the stiffness and rigidity he needed for, for punching power and for kicking power. Um, bodybuilders 
used isometrics as part of their training for a long time. And then they stopped calling it isometrics and they just said posing. Mm -hmm. So like Arnold and the, you know, the seventies and eighties, they would say, Hey, after every workout pre-contest, I'll pose for 40 minutes. And that brings out the definition. Were they? The yeah. Which, which is really, I mean, it's just highlighting their access to these muscles and being able to contract them uh, individually too, which is all part of this connectivity, uh, you know, surrounding isometrics where, you know, you can really enhance that process of like your central nervous system and being able to, uh, channel in a bunch more force and, and, and get a louder contraction out of your muscles. If you really focus on it was so back to your Arnold statement, when they were doing that, were they actually doing it for the true benefits of isometrics or were they doing it for posing? And that was just a side benefit. They like didn't do it to be better at posing. They would say that it brings out detail and definition. Oh, they would. Hardness. I didn't know that. Yeah. So it would, it would say things like if you look at by, by old bodybuilding magazines, they would say, um, you know, pre-contest, I don't, you know, I like to do 30 minutes of posing after every workout, really squeezing the muscles, bringing out the definition, the hardness. And so, and then the way they explained it was it just, you know, burn body fat in the target muscles. It's not, that's not what happened. What happened was that they were actually activating more muscle fibers through isometrics. All right, everybody, today's giveaway, Maps Symmetry. Here's how you can win free access. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won. Now, everybody else, Map Symmetry is 50% off. This is for a limited time because in today's episode, we talk about a component of the program, uh, Map Symmetry. So if you want 50% off Map Symmetry, Go to mapsymmetry.com and use the code SYM50 for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. You said something about isometrics that's real important. They're extremely safe. Okay, so, so let me back up for a second. There's three types of muscle contractions. There's the lifting of a weight. So if I'm doing a curl, I'm lifting it. That's called a concentric muscle uh, contraction. When I lower the weight with control, that's also a contraction. That's called eccentric. Holding a weight would be isometric. So isometric contractions, you don't move. Yeah, it's immovable. If someone's doing an isometric exercise, they're not doing a rep. They're, they're, I mean, they're doing a rep in the sense that they're timing themselves, but they're not moving, okay? That's what makes them so safe. That's why you could do this on people who are recovering from injury yeah, or total beginners. Stage. Also, simultaneously, nothing has been shown to activate more muscle fibers than a maximal exertion isometric, which is also why it simultaneously is so valuable for advanced lifters. So when you're activating muscle fibers, the more muscle fibers you can activate, theoretically, the more muscle strength and growth you can you can trigger. Because if you have, let's say you have 100 muscle fibers, there's a lot more than that in a muscle, but let's say there's 100 of them, and you only activate 80, then you're only going to signal 80 muscle fibers to grow and get stronger. If you can activate 100 of them, all of them, then you're going to get a you know 20% more muscle fiber growth because you're activating more of them. Well, isn't isn't isometrics the only way to get a full 100 potential? Yeah, and or I mean, it's it's the most effective way. I mean, you could probably do it if you're advanced and you're going like hardcore, like exerting yourself. But with an isometric, because and there's certain types of isometrics that do this. When you're pushing against an immovable object, which we'll get to uh, in the episode, is a form of isometrics. Because you're pushing and it's not moving and you're using maximal force, your body recruits more and more muscle fibers because it's not moving. Yeah. So it's like your body calls upon so many, uh oh, it's not moving, call more, uh oh, it's not moving, use them all. So it activates all the muscle fibers. Other muscle contractions don't necessarily do this. Well, and it's interesting if you go like per joint, like around where the muscle is being contracted, there's a 10 degree carryover of this, of this contractibility. So there's, you get strength, um, that actually like carries over even further in terms of like in range or a little bit further past where, you know, that, that actual movement is getting its maximal exertion. Yeah. So to be, so to, to emphasize that. So if I do an isometric in this position, 15 here with degrees, my arm, sorry, I say 10, 50, yeah, yeah. 50, so it's 10 to 15, I think yeah. some, I think some studies will say even as much as 20. But let's say I'm holding uh, the cut contraction here. So this is where I'm getting the isometric uh, contraction. First off, one thing about isometrics that's cool is I can train a specific part of the muscle contraction. So if you're doing an exercise and you notice there's a part of the rep that you're just weaker than the others, I could do isometrics in that part of the rep and get stronger in that part of the rep, thus making me stronger in the entire full rep or full range of motion. 
But what Justin's saying, which is also cool, is it's not just in that point. It's also about 15 degrees above and below that. So if it's here for me with the bicep squeeze and I get stronger here, I'm also stronger here and here. So there's carryover, meaning you don't have to do every single point of a, of a contraction to get the full strength a, a, along the full range of motion because there's a 15 degree carryover up or down. Yeah. One other like little fun fact before we get into like the actual workout programming and all that too, like that it's used a lot in therapy as well because of the analgesic effects. So there's, you actually get pain relief because a lot of times there's a weakness and instability uh, that's not being addressed properly. So now if you spend the time to isometrically push and squeeze and, and maximize the recruitment potential, it actually like sends a feedback back that this is secure. Now it actually relieves that, that actual pain signal, which is, is the si exercise. which is the science behind why people that have followed our prime pro program, or walk through the webinar totally. that we've done and they feel amazing afterwards. Right like afterwards. All, right afterwards. It's an like, immediate response. Oh my God, it's my great. hips feel better. Yeah. Oh my God, my low back feels better because of that reason right there. 100%. You know, another thing that's a, a, a neat point too is you talk about the three different types of contractions and what I think is really interesting, even in advanced lifters, people lifting all the time, there's huge opportunity to improve the eccentric portion and also the isometric portion mm -hmm. because they're the like two most neglected. Like everybody yeah. thinks about lifting the weight up or moving the weight. I've, I've brought it up on the show before. I don't think I ever walked into a gym and saw more than one or two people actually doing a true four second eccentric, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, negative in their in their uh, exercise they're doing, and then never see anybody doing isometrics. And so, if you're listening to this and you've been lifting for a really long time and you haven't put any sort of focus in those two years, huge opportunity. Huge. All yeah. right. So let's talk about the three main types of isometrics. Uh, the first one, which would be the most advanced and most intense type of isometric would be against an immovable object. So that means you're taking an object and you're applying maximal force to it. It's not moving. So the contraction is an isometric. So this would be like me getting underneath a bench press, but the bar is loaded so heavy that I can't possibly lift it. Or I have it pushed up against the safeties in the cage, for example. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing as hard as I can. The bar is not moving. I'm using an external, uh, something externally to generate force or for me to generate force against. Mm -hmm. That's uh, an immovable object. That is very advanced. That's not a way that I would apply isometrics to a beginner or somebody yeah. who's got an injury or someone who we're trying to. So extrinsic force. Is extrinsic what you're force. Yeah. But for an advanced lifter, holy cow. Like, do this, uh, and we'll talk about when you could do stuff like this, but do this in a workout. And watch how the rest of the workout feels or watch how it feels uh, at the end of the workout. Well, you see this uh, in like power lifters use this strategy a lot with like f sticking points, mm -hmm. right? On their bench press or their deadlift, they'll, they'll set the rack up to a point where they know like, man, anytime I get to my max weight, I fail right here. And so they'll set the rack up to where that failing point is. And then they'll create this isometric contraction yeah. right here to help break through that plateau. Yeah. One thing you could do too, if you have a home gym, which is, this is really cool. I have yet to see anybody. I've seen a few people do this, but a lot of people haven't done this. And this is just phenomenal is you could take, if you have a home gym, you could bolt two hooks into the concrete that are just stuck, hmm. have a couple chains uh, attached to either end and then put collars on the chains now. And the chains could be long. So you could use a short, part of the chain, long part of the chain. Now you could put a barbell underneath that and you could bench against an immovable yeah. object, row, overhead press, a whole squat, host deadlift. Of movements you can do that. I mean, anything you want, curl, and it doesn't move. And uh, like I said earlier in the episode, you'll activate all your muscle fibers uh, or definitely more than you would with other exercise. But again, this is an advanced yeah. type of isometrics. This one will fatigue you and can get you sore. Yeah, this was also one of those kind of secret weapons for... Um, a lot of those combines, I, I noticed some of the guys had learned the, the, the ability how to uh, apply that type of like extrinsic force in, a, in an isometric um, before they would go to try and PR a lift or do something yes. in that regard. And, and it is an advanced technique, but it's very effective because to be able to, you know, prep your body ahead of time to to prime that amount of and generate that amount of force. Uh, when you go now to lift the weight, it's amazing uh, that your body just, you know, already has been prepped uh, to, to be able to, to, to access that. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're really turning on the CNS uh, with something like this. All right. The next one, this one is what you talked about just now, Adam, with powerlifters is 
just holding a position with resistance. So this is not me pushing against an immovable object, but rather me using a weight, putting it in a position where I have to support it and then holding it there. So it'd be like doing a squat, going down to the bottom of a squat and then holding that bottom position for 10 or 15 seconds and then coming up. This one is probably most commonly used with strength athletes where they're trying to work on a sticking point where like, you know, maybe two inches off the ground, their deadlift gets stuck mm -hmm. or when they bench press, it's the lockout yep. or the bottom position. The bottom position, you just hold and then we push and kill all momentum. Yes. yes. Now, what what is happening different in the body with the immovable object versus weight that's resisting it? Is it not getting the same CNS response as and recruitment response or would it be the same? So similar, but you're going to activate more muscle fibers when you're pushing against an immovable object. Because when you're holding something, you're not pushing as hard as you can. Otherwise, you'd move the weight. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to hold. There's value there. The value is that you're strengthening a position in that rep, and it's not as damaging. Pushing against an immovable object, like go try squatting against something that doesn't move. Yeah. And the rate, the risk of injury is higher, and it'll fry your body more than holding than holding. Yeah. A weight intrinsically, well. you're really like you're you're bracing a lot more, and so you're stabilizing your whole body within that position versus like you know pressing all of that energy outward. And so you don't have as much emphasis on like the stability of your joints and your spine. So would you think, okay, so one is you're, you're resisting the weight more. The other one, you're actually you're exerting, trying to move it. exerting everything uh -huh. against something that it's can't all output. Move. It's like less on the, um, the input. Yeah. The, oh. the, the one where you're pushing against an immovable object, that one definitely can, can sap your, it almost recovery. sounds like one of them obtains more eccentric like uh, benefits and then the other one it, it obtains more concentric like benefits. I would think the immovable object you are trying to contract as hard as you yeah, possibly yeah. can. Yes. If you're got a barbell that's got 300 pounds on it, you can't bench that. Yeah. You're resisting that coming down yeah. more than you're contracting. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so I, a, I, I wonder if there's any studies a valid, uh, yeah, it's a valid that point. would show that w doing one of the other tips more towards uh, similar benefits as the concentric versus the eccentric. So I would use the immovable object and that one would supplement a set for me because it's so it, 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 you exert so much energy with it. Mm -hmm. The holding a position, I can add that to my sets, and I'm not really adding. I mean, as long as I adjust the weight, right? I'm not really adding to the recovery load. So I can do, and I do this in my workouts all the time. I pause reps all the time with certain exercises, and it doesn't really hammer me uh, or or take away from my recovery. If I do an immovable object type rep. That's a set. Like I'm, I'm, I know I have to take away another set in order to add that because it's going to fry my body. So in, in terms of intensity, the immovable object type of uh, isometric is just takes taxes the body much more than holding the position. The third type of isometric has the least produces the least damage on the body. It's it doesn't require lots of recovery. This actually can facilitate recovery. This type of contraction. And this one's the most appropriate for correctional exercise. And this is where you're just trying to create internal and intrinsic isometric contraction. So this would be like flexing, right? Or posing or correctional type movements like you find in Prime Pro. Prime Pro is full mm -hmm. of this kind of stuff where I'm in a 90-90 and I'm trying to hold my leg up in a position. I'm not pushing against something. I'm not resisting something necessarily, but I'm just trying to activate. I'm just trying. So this was like correctional where it's like, I can't fire my mid back. Um, my shoulder blade rises too much when I do an overhead press or whatever. This is more like I'm doing it without resistance, except for the resistance I create myself. Right. My so body. it's more gravity. Well, it's more body weight, the driven, yeah. right? So it's like, yeah. And you do, you use this a lot in mobility technique. And, and so there's, there's some, um, I guess, confusion because you are there's some mo actual movements that are happening while simultaneously you have to brace and hold your body in position which could be considered isometric uh, while you're going through certain movements so um, and this is something that's really important to train uh, which applies to your big compound list because to be able to keep your body uh, from shifting and, and from twisting and rotating yeah. at all is is a massive uh, consideration because that's usually a lot of times where we get into these 
problematic areas where injuries occur and, and where stress uh, gets directed to, to the joint. What would be an example way. of that? What, what's an exercise that would be an example of what you're describing right now? What, what comes to mind right away? Oh, so. if I'm talking about like something that I'm doing for a mobility drill. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm like, doing like, if I'm trying to uh, say just a, like a simple wall circle yeah. and I'm, and I'm using my, my shoulder uh, is the directed point where of rotation, where I'm trying to keep uh, my arm locked out. I'm trying to keep my shoulder from rotating with it to make it easier yeah. and my hips from rotating because my, my natural tendency is to want to kind of turn towards the rotation Got it. and to be able to brace and keep everything completely yeah. straight. So it's like controlling uh, the rest of my body in the kinetic chain, not and, and being able to isolate a joint so it can move freely. Yeah. Another example would be like a uh, like a lizard with rotation, and when I'm at the end range of that, and I'm trying to activate that, yeah, that, that full, full ro ro rotation while I'm trying to keep everything else very neutral. Yeah. Now, now, uh, interesting, right? So this this last type of isometric contraction you find in map symmetry in the first two weeks. Uh, a, a lot of what we do in the first two weeks is is similar to this. Um, and now we talk about map symmetry as being this like unilateral training exercise balances right and left creates a symmetrical looking body helps bring up weaknesses, but the first two weeks is isometrics. And you might wonder well, why are there isometrics in there? Because isometrics are a great way to balance out strength output to give, uh, the body, the range of motion it needs on both sides and essentially to activate and wake things up. So when you're trying to train unilaterally, you're probably gonna have one side that's stronger than the other. Doing a week or two of isometrics in the beginning is going to help you when you do your your unilateral training because it's going to wake things up and give you that form that you need. Otherwise, it's so yeah. far off. Well, it's going to provide control and yes. stability. That's right. Which is something that you need to consider that, especially once we start uh, unilateral training because the 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 tendency to rotate and to compensate uh, gets heightened when you just work on one side of the body. That's well, right. Well, an even simpler way, I think, to communicate it would be when you do bilateral stuff, both feet on the ground or like a, a bench press, both arms or like that. Most everybody has one side that is more dominant than the other. One of the main reasons why we all have that is there's better communication to one side than the other side. Right. When you do these, this first phase in isometrics is we are working on that communication. We are working on your ability to communicate to the weaker side and we're, we're isolating that one side so you can really focus on that communication. And then build muscle in it. And then going into the unilateral work is the, the building muscle on that Absolutely. side. Absolutely. All right. So there's, there's three main ways that you can use isometrics, the, the different types of isometrics. The first way is before your workouts. I like using isometrics before I do my traditional workout because I'm activating more muscle fibers. I'm giving myself better ranges of motion or better stability and control. And this gives me a better workout. Like if I do isometrics before I bench press, this becomes more correctional, but it allows me to get better technique and form and get into the groove better. So MAPS Prime does a lot of this in, uh, in priming. Priming is a lot of isometrics before you do your workout, mm -hmm. giving you better technique and form and getting more out of the exercises that you're doing. So if you're doing, uh, if you're doing isometrics before your workout, you're looking at, you know, 10 to 15 minutes before your workout. And this will trump any warm up that you've ever done. This is not just reducing risk of injury, mm -hmm. which is what warm ups are supposed to do. It's also activating more muscle fibers and just giving you better results. Yeah. And the, I mean, there's favorable posture for uh, performing these movements and regardless of information out there that likes to get into the nuance of, you know, morphology and, and how people, uh, bodies differ and whatnot, there's always going to be favorable positions to put your body in before you, uh, perform the movement. And so priming and being able to isometrically contract the muscles to be able to uh, support that position uh, will put uh, an advantage into your workout like you've never had. Like, so this is something that will prep you um, and, and help you to perform at your highest. I'm so glad you brought that point up because this is an area where I think there's some contention with some of the things that we communicate on this podcast in regards to mobility and priming. And there, se there seems to be this uh, camp, uh, and they're they're an intelligent camp. There are a lot of a lot of smart coaches and trainers that uh, just advocate for you know doing more sets, and that they're and they use the morphology argument all the time. They're like we're all so unique and different. This idea of that we should squ squat all the same way or do these mm -hmm. exercises the same way, 
And I really, and even though there's some truth within that, mm -hmm. I really don't like that message because in my experience, every client that I've ever trained ha has room for improvement to the point you're making. There is a more optimal or there is a better position for you to be in to get the most from this workout and also to protect you from not getting hurt. Right. So, so on an individual basis. Exactly. Right. Yes. So this idea of, oh, you know, mobility stuff is bullshit and all this. Like, I hate that movement in our space right now because it is such a terrible message because everybody, every, I don't care how advanced you are, can improve uh, their ability to move the weight uh, better, more safely, more effectively. And one of the best ways of doing that is by priming the body before you go into move by activating certain muscles and maybe even relaxing other ones so that I put can put my body in the most optimal position to get the most from this exercise. Yes. So before your workout, isometrics serve two functions. One, wake up the muscles you're looking to wake up, activate more muscle fibers, and two, give you better movement so that you reduce your risk of injury and get better, better reps, essentially. All right, the second way that isometrics are typically used is at the end of a workout. And this is how bodybuilders traditionally have used isometrics. This is when they flex and pose a muscle at the end of a workout. They just finished their chest workout. Now they're done. And now they're going to sit there and hold a chest squeeze for you know 30 seconds or 15 seconds or whatever. Mm -hmm. At the end of the workout, the benefits really are maximize the pump. And there is value in the pump in that it does signal muscle growth to an extent, but also it's to get to wake up any dormant muscle fibers that might not have been woken up with that workout with a maximal exertion squeeze. But personally, after the workout, the value I see is the pump. Once I'm done with my workout and I want to really get every little ounce of blood into that muscle to send that pump signal, that's when I do something like this where I'll get into a position, squeeze the muscle, hold the hell out of it for you know 20 seconds, 30 seconds, rest, do a couple of those and watch what happens. It takes your pump another 10% higher. Wouldn't, wouldn't you make the case too that there's some benefit there though also for just simply being able to train your ability to activate the muscles that you want to call upon in a state of fatigue or exhaustion or like when you've totally. been spent. Mm -hmm. like totally. One of the things that happens that's that to almost everybody when they lift is as soon as the muscle uh, fatigues, there's breakdown in the mechanics. And this is what we see a lot. Like somebody will be doing an exercise and then get three or four more reps, but the, the muscles fatigue. So this idea of, oh, I've trained a whole hour now. I'm all done working mm -hmm. out. My entire body is fatigued, but then I can still call upon yeah. a ton of attention to right to the bicep mm -hmm. or right to my quad or whatever muscle that I'm activating. There has to be some value in training that skill so that when you go to apply that type of mental connection while you're in the middle of your workout, you have this, you've trained yeah. your ability, even under fatigue, to stay connected to the muscle that you want to activate. You're you hardwiring a discipline there. Right. Like within your lift, which is an important factor, because that is a very common um, way that uh, people don't squeeze out the maximal potential is because the breakdown happens on fatigue. There is a way to, to psychologically push through that and uh, be more disciplined in that. And so I think it is uh, that does apply very well. Yes. Now, you can also do correctional type isometrics at the end of the workout. And this is more for the analgesic effect. So if you finish your workout, oh, I'm a little sore in my shoulder. Then at the end, you can do some correctional type exercise. And what it'll do is it'll change the way your body moves afterwards. Because what tends to happen when you tweak your body a little bit is your movement patterns change a little bit. And sometimes those movement patterns end up causing more pain later on. So doing isometrics at the end in a correctional way yeah. can get your body moving a little better. So you're not walking or moving funny. And, you know, you're not getting even more problems, you know, later on. The third way, this is also a popular way bodybuilders like to use isometrics is in between sets. Now, the reason why this is valuable is if you are trying to feel a muscle in an exercise, mm. there's almost no better way to get yourself to feel a muscle, especially a muscle you have trouble connecting to, than using isometrics in between sets. So let's say you're, you're, you're doing your presses and you just don't feel your chest in your bench press. Well, after you do a set in between, squeeze the hell out of your chest or get some bands or cables and hold a position or hold a position. You, you pick, I like the squeeze position, hold it, squeeze it, feel it, then go do your bench press. And all of a sudden you can move and position yourself in a way to where you can feel the chest working. It's really effective for glutes, lats, 
hamstrings, areas that people tend to have issues feeling, especially when they're beginners. Well, wasn't it uh, Ben Bukowski who's really highlighting the fact that, um, you know, certain muscles that are underdeveloped, it's it's really a connection issue. Yes. And yeah, yeah. so to, to be able to um, call upon a muscle that you're trying to develop more within exercise, especially if it's a compound exercise or something where you're using a lot of muscles at once, um, to, to have that opportunity in between sets to, uh, enhance it and really, you know, fire it off, uh, and then take it back into that, that lift, uh, will, will help to, uh, put more emphasis on that. My favorite way to use this is what you were saying, Sal, and, and specifically to the butt. One of the most common, um, exercises that, uh, you know, my, a lot of times my female, but both male and female, but my female clients tend to care more about this is the ability to feel their butt working when they squat. And a lot of times they don't, they feel it in their quads and hamstrings everywhere else, but their butt. And so using like a floor bridge, an isometric floor bridge between sets was, I mean, this was something that like, this was Katrina for a long time. Katrina was, uh, has always been a pretty good squatter as far as strength. But she's like, my butt never gets sore. I never really feel it in 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 there. And now she was a big runner and she was very quad dominant and and because of those things. And so we had to use this a lot to get her to be able to activate that both squats and deadlifts for a while, but huge difference when you teach them that way. Cause it is like you, you know, you're you're telling you're loading somebody on their back and tell them to go through this movement. And you're, I mean, you're thinking stability and oh, I got all this weight and oh my God, just getting yeah. out of the hole. And so also to be saying, oh, and just use your butt to get out of that is really difficult. The body's gonna default to mm -hmm. what it's most comfortable doing or what it's been doing for years or decades in her case. And so getting the you to train like, no, you need to fire this, the isometrics in between sets, floor bridges in between squatting was like game changer for me. Yeah. Uh, I did this to myself as a kid to feel my lats because when I first started working out my back, I didn't feel my lats. And I had read that squeezing the lats in between sets would help. And it did. And then I did exactly what you did, Adam. This was the way I used isometrics with my clients. Before I learned about isometrics, I figured this is a great way to get my clients to feel certain muscle groups and it was most common was butt. And yeah. I did exactly the same thing, floor bridge at the top, mm -hmm. squeeze your glutes. Oh, you feeling burned now? Cool. We rest a little bit, do a set. Now all of a sudden they feel their butt when they're doing a squat. Yeah. Look, check this out. Here's what we did. Because we're talking about isometrics and because map symmetry includes a phase of isometrics and of course the rest of it's unilateral, we're going to make map symmetry 50% off. This is a limited time for this episode. So if you're interested in map symmetry, you want it half off. Just go to mapssymmetry.com. So M A P S S Y M M E T R Y, mapssymmetry.com. And then use the code S Y M 50 for the 50% off discount. Also, you can find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 